Well now, after decades of anticipation of the James Webb Space Telescope and the science it's going to provide, we have so far a truly picture-perfect mission, and even some initial images that are rather breathtaking. In other words, this telescope works. For those joining the story now, this mission took decades to make a reality. Budget overruns, issues ranging far and wide, and political concerns created all sorts of problems that plagued this project, but when it finally came time to launch, oh, launch it did indeed. To recap, the launch was basically perfect. The venerable Ariane 5 rocket that lofted JWST into space performed about as well as it realistically could have, preserving its unusually solid track record for accurate launches and saving the JWST a good deal of fuel for its primary mission, indeed extending it significantly. We're going to have this telescope for a good long while, for observations exceeding a decade, and who knows by how much, since there are further ways to conserve fuel during observations and keep it going even longer. JWST then unfolded itself in an unprecedented magnificent feat of engineering without any major problems. This was quite an accomplishment, since the telescope had to be launched folded so that it would fit in the payload fairing of the Ariane 5, which is one of the largest in the industry but still limited. This created a situation where the telescope had hundreds of potential failure points and a whole lot of moving parts, but NASA and its contractors are used to this and often deal with high numbers of potential failure points, but not often as many as JWST had, and there wasn't a single failure in the launch and deployment of the telescope. The telescope then began its month-long journey to L2. Here it's worth explaining just what Lagrange points are and why they are useful for spacecraft. These are special points in space located between gravitational objects that give an advantage if you want to keep a spacecraft in a certain position and conserve fuel by minimizing the amount of fuel spent keeping it in position. This is due to the gravity from the objects acting on the spacecraft, creating an advantage. There are five Lagrange points with Earth, some stable, some not. The unstable ones are known as L1, L2, and L3. The stable ones are L4 and L5. Most are useful. L1 is where the Solar Observatory SOHO sits, because it provides a full, uninterrupted view of the Sun. L2 is where James Webb is now located, and the reason for that is that it's easy to communicate with probes at this point, and it offers an uninterrupted view of the cosmos, keeping the Sun, Earth, and Moon behind it, and also allows for uninterrupted Sun exposure for power. But given that it's one of the unstable points, JWST must still expend fuel to stay in position, and also to counter the effects of radiation pressure from the sun. Remember, JWST's sun shield has a lot of area, and thus acts as a light sail. L3 is a point we never use because it's always behind the sun. L4 and L5, being stable, allow for orbits. At these Jupiter-Sun Lagrange points, for example, you'll find the Trojan asteroids that have accumulated there. In short, L2 was the best place to locate JWST from a fuel consumption and observation point of view. All while this was happening, JWST was going through another very important step that there was no way to speed up. It had to cool down to operational temperature after the launch. This took a while. The telescope essentially is hot on the sun side, cold on the telescope side, which is why it has multiple sheets in its sunshade to allow for the temperature extremes of the two sides of the spacecraft. Currently, those extremes are 128 degrees Fahrenheit on the sun side and negative 393 on the cold side, or 53 and minus 236 Celsius, respectively. After reaching L2 and fully deploying came the process of aligning the individual mirror segments of the telescope. Interestingly, there was actually a contingency plan in place that if the two ears of the mirror didn't properly deploy, the remaining core mirrors could have been used as a telescope and it wouldn't have been a total loss. Rather, it would simply have been operating at reduced function. That did not happen, and both deployed normally, completing the telescope. But aligning mirrors is a necessary process. The telescope's launch and deployment wouldn't have allowed for pre-alignment, so it had to be done in space. The power of a rocket launch just isn't very good for holding a precision alignment. This was accomplished by tiny motors that move the mirrors into position that work very, very slowly, not unlike the rate at which grass grows, so the process took several weeks. Two test images were taken during this process, one before alignment that shows all the individual mirrors looking at a star, 
but not all aligned together, creating multiple images. In this image, you can see multiple stars, but they're actually all the same star, just with the mirrors all slightly off from each other. The star in the image is HD 84406, a type G star, which is the same class as the Sun, but this one is more massive. The star was chosen because it's relatively isolated in the field of view. After alignment came the first focused image from the James Webb Space Telescope, and what an image it is. You can see in this photograph the star 2 mass, J17554042 plus 6551277 in crisp focus, with a backdrop of individual galaxies and stars. This also tells us that the mirrors are ground correctly. This was a problem for the Hubble Space Telescope, which had an improperly curved mirror that wasn't discovered until it was in space, which had to be fixed with a space shuttle servicing mission to install corrective optics so the telescope could focus. The ongoing next step now is activating the telescope's instrumentation and cameras and calibrating them. With any luck, JWST will begin observations sometime around summer. So the natural question is, now that we have JWST up and running, What's the next space telescope going to look like? The story is actually rather odd and very different from that of JWST. This telescope wasn't actually designed to be an astronomical telescope at all. Rather, it was supposed to be part of a top secret spy satellite. Repurposed as a space telescope, it was initially known as the W-First project, but has since been renamed the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Nancy Grace Roman was an astronomer that worked in stellar classification, and she was NASA's astronomy chief in the 60s and 70s, but she was also instrumental in the realization of the Hubble Space Telescope, to the point of often being called the mother of Hubble. It's fitting indeed that a successor to Hubble will bear her name. The telescope's primary mirror is 2.4 meters, which is the same size as the Hubble Space Telescope, but less than James Webb's 6.5 meters. Its instrumentation package has a wide-field camera that can handle visible and near-infrared light, much like Hubble, and a smaller field-of-view camera with a spectrometer that also covers visible and near-infrared wavelengths. The telescope's launch date, as of right now, will be in May of 2027. So how does a modern space telescope have its origins as a spy satellite? Cue in the National Reconnaissance Office, or NRO, of the U.S. government. In short, they had planned spy satellites with very large mirrors designed to look at Earth for clandestine purposes. Two mirrors were not used, and the NRO basically had two Hubble Space Telescope mirrors sitting around. But by having a shorter focal length, they would provide a wider field of view than Hubble. They eventually donated the mirrors to NASA, essentially not wanting them to go to waste. But there was a catch. Because of the origins of these mirrors, one condition is that the telescope must never under any circumstances look at Earth, presumably because NASA's imagery is public, and someone might be able to work out the capabilities and resolution of existing telescope-based spy satellites, though I would think you could do that anyway from knowing the specs. The Roman telescope research objectives are wide-ranging. One is to specifically try to probe dark energy and the expansion of the universe in conjunction with the European Space Agency's Euclid mission. Dark energy is strange because it either exists and is driving the accelerated expansion of the universe, or there is something very wrong with general relativity. We may find out which it is from these missions, and if it actually is a form of energy, then questions can be asked and probed about whether this acceleration has been constant or has evolved somehow. The telescope will also study exoplanets and their habitability, and specifically help fill out the picture of just how common solar systems similar to ours actually are. This is actually a pretty weighty question since what we've seen so far is that our solar system is not normal and no analog of it has yet been found. This is where gravitational microlensing comes into play. The idea is that by using it, you can get a huge boost in what you can see with a telescope like this. That could allow, under the right conditions, the ability to directly detect exoplanets only a few times larger than our moon and even Mars-sized rogue planets. Planets the size of Earth should easily be on the table for this telescope with this technique. The telescope also provides a coronagraph for direct imaging of exoplanets, allowing us to get spectra of nearby giant planets. And of course, there will be ample room for individual researchers and of course serendipitous events that come along, as with JWST. And the growth of our space telescope capabilities with Roman and JWST 
will essentially provide some kind of replacement, but not exactly by any means, for the aging Hubble Space Telescope, which we can essentially lose at any moment. Indeed, last year it almost failed, and many were saying it was the end for the telescope. But NASA has since got it back up and running and doing science again. Estimates put its service life as lasting until at least 2026, or longer with enough luck. But that may not be the end of the story for Hubble. The thing about Hubble is that it was designed to be serviced, unlike James Webb. The whole idea was to send up the space shuttle and crew to replace instruments or change out obsolete ones, which happened a number of times, most recently in 2009. But with the retirement of the space shuttle, it didn't seem that we'd have the capability to continue to service Hubble and keep it going. But this has changed with the very rapid development of manned rockets in the US with SpaceX, Blue Origin, and NASA's SLS system and others it may now actually be possible to service Hubble again, especially with SpaceX's crewed Dragon, or eventually even robotically. This could give Hubble all new gyroscopes and replace failed equipment, and essentially give new life to the telescope and keep it operating for a few more decades. Some proposals have been made to this end, but nothing concrete. But at the rate human spaceflight is developing, it very well may happen, and the venerable old telescope might see new life. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently worried about servicing the Hubble Space Telescope. What if we keep doing it for centuries? I can see the headline now in the Galactic Daily Newspaper. The humans were inadvertently destroyed after servicing the Hubble Space Telescope for the 242nd time. Not being the sharpest cookies in the galactic jar, they installed generalized artificial intelligence and a space laser, and the telescope finally took its bitter revenge. Very disturbing. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.